Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Now here's an unusual piece of furniture with an interesting story behind it. I have it on good authority that this is called a paymaster's desk. Light enough to be transported by horseback and a drawer large enough to carry all the funds to pay the workers. Now we're not going to use it for payroll, but it makes a great end table. And I'll show you how to build one today, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. This Napa Valley Champagne is the proud achievement of Jack and Jamie Davies. Their Schramsberg label is highly respected here in the Napa Valley. They are also collectors of southwestern antiques. This room is filled with them. I love this chair. Couldn't be simpler, just made from pine boards. This desk shows elements of southwestern design with these cutouts. In the center of the room here, we have an ancient-looking coffee table, even though we know that coffee tables are relatively recent innovation. Look at this chest on stand. It's been painted. It has nicely cut dovetails on the corner, but the stand is a little unusual. It has flat legs that are set at a 45-degree angle. Now, there are rugs all over the room. These hanging on the wall add a splash of color as well as those that are on the floor. But here's the piece I wanted you to see. Jack tells me that this is a paymaster's desk. It would be transported by horse from location to location. And for instance, the miners would be paid. It's a nice piece made of pine with splayed legs, a stretcher at the bottom. If I spin it around for you, you can see that there's a drawer where the funds were kept. Now this is a perfect table as an end table. And we know that end tables are very difficult to find. Now this is a piece that I know we have the technology to build back at the workshop. Hey, it must be payday. And here's the paymaster's table. Of course, I couldn't leave well enough alone. I had to make my own refinements. The corners of the original drawer were just nailed together. I've dovetailed them. The bottom was just nailed on. I've set a piece of plywood into a groove. And the runners that support the draw, they were just nailed on. But I had to cut a dado to give it more support. And oh yeah, the top was made up of several narrow boards, and I chose just one wide pine board. Now if you'd like to build this paymaster's table, a measure drawing is available with the materials list, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now this project was not built from new pine, it was built from salvage material. Let me show you what I started with. Some old pine beams. Look at this, the tenon is still on this one with the hole for the peg. There was actually a plate on this one that said attic and pointed towards the front. So it's possible this came out of an old house. If you work with the material, you can get nice clear pine boards like this. Now, it's no bargain. In fact, you may pay more for this material than new lumber you can pick up at the lumber yard. But what I like about this pine is that it has a lot of character. If you look at the growth rings, you can see how close together they are, which makes the material stable. And the color cannot be duplicated with new material. Now, the first thing I have to do to work with these old beams is remove any bits of iron. We found these nails in this particular piece, and this big spike was right in that location, easy to find. And the next thing I want to do is cut it down to a more manageable size. So I want to use my resaw, which is equipped with this resaw blade. It's about three inches wide, coarse teeth with carbide tips, which allow it to cut through the material easily. Now, before we get started, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses.
The longest part in the project is about 24 inches long. So I'm going to cross cut this piece roughly in half. And because it's thick, I'm going to have to cut from both sides with my radio arm. Now I'm going to resaw it in half again. It's always a good idea with the band saw to keep a minimum amount of blade unsupported. So I'm going to lower down my support strip before I run the piece through. Now this piece is going to yield some good parts. I'm going to try to get a couple of the legs out of this piece. And the first thing I think I'm going to do is cut this check out, which will be right in this area. It doesn't seem to run very far through the piece. And then I have a nice clear area right here. And I think I can get two legs for the project right out of that. Well, now that surface is nice and flat. Now the surface planer will take care of the other side. Now I have one edge that's straight and square to the surface. Now a pass through my table saw makes the other edge straight and square, but I can make it even smoother by one final pass through the joiner. All right, I have two pieces for the cleats under the top, four blanks for my legs, the end stretchers, the center stretcher, and a couple draw runners. Well, in summary, you can see that I not only paid more for the material, but I spent a lot of time at the woodworking tools preparing the stock. But I wouldn't do it unless it was worth it. Now, here's one of the blanks for the legs. And I'm actually going to leave that nail hole. I think it adds a bit of character. Now, both at the bottom and at the top of the leg, the angle is 9 degrees. Now the ends on the stretcher that connects the legs are also cut at 9 degrees. And you'll note that I've left the piece a little long to allow for the tenons. Let's make the mortises in the legs next. Now to mill the mortises, I'm going to use my stationary mortiser. And I want the mortise to be parallel to the floor and the top of the table. To do that, I need a wedge that's 9 degrees. Now, to make that wedge, I started out with a scrap of hardwood that was a foot long. And I know that by geometric calculation, for a 9-degree angle right here, for every foot of run, I want 1 and 7 eighths inches of rise. So I connected the two points, set it in my tapering jig, and adjusted the jig until this line is parallel with the slot in the table, which is parallel to the blade. The legs are connected to a cleat at the top with a mortise and tenon joint. But you'll notice that I've kept the leg flush to the inside of the cleat in consideration of the draw. I've just made the first shoulder cut for a tenon at the end of the stretcher that connects the legs. I've got a stop block 
and I'm using my miter gauge which has been set at 9 degrees. Now you only can make one shoulder cut on each end before I have to turn the miter gauge to 9 degrees on the other side of zero. Now here's that opposing cut. The tenons at the top of the legs are a quarter of an inch shorter, so I'm just moving the fence over and the procedure is the same. To make the cheek cuts on the tenon, I'm using my tenoning jig, which rides in the miter slot of the saw. Now I've tipped this guide fence back so that the nine degree cut sits flat on the saw table, and I clamp it in place to hold it safely. Now with this setup, I can make one cheek cut on each tenon. Now for the stretchers, I need to raise the blade about a quarter of an inch. Right there. Now I'm just moving the fence of the tenoning jig over to make the other cheek cut. That's just right. Now we'll lower the blade again to make the cheek cuts on the legs. Now to complete the top and bottom of each tenon, I've tipped the saw to nine degrees and set it so it's only a quarter of an inch above the table. First I make the cut near the shoulder and then nibble away the rest. Now to complete the other edge of the tenon, it's necessary to move the miter gauge to the other slot. You'll notice that the edges of the tenon are perpendicular to the shoulder cut on the legs. The best way to remove that excess material is at the bandsaw. Where the center and end stretchers intersect, there's a lap joint. The depth of the cut on the center stretcher is a quarter of an inch, and it's an eighth of an inch on the end stretcher. I do that at the table saw. Now, it may not look that way at first glance, but the leg assemblies are a little bit closer together at the top of the table than they are where they meet the floor. So what I want to do next is take a little bit off the top outside edge of each cleat so it fits properly against the top. To make that cut, I've tipped the table saw blade one degree from 90. And I'll just run the piece through on edge. Before I do any assembly, I want to spend some time rounding the corners of the cleat at my sanding center. Now these holes that I'm pre-drilling and counter-boring in the cleat will be for the screws that I'll use to secure the top. Here I'm elongating the outermost holes of the cleat to allow for some expansion of the top and seasonal changes. 
With a little bit of glue on all the joints of the leg assembly, I'll clamp them together and set them aside to dry. And I think we'll start working on the top. Well, here's what remains of the board that I used to make the prototype top. And it's about 20 inches wide. If you look at the end, you can see that it's been grooved on each edge. And there's a little bead detail, so it was probably part of some wall paneling system. Now, there's enough left here to get one more top. Still pretty smooth in this area. And I'm going to cut it a little bit longer than what I need. I'll cut it at about 32 and a half inches. Well, I'd say that just about takes care of the sanding on the top. I don't want to take off too much material. I'll leave this scratch. That adds a little bit of character. And I'm certainly not going to sand it down enough to get the paint out from around these knots. Now, I've stripped the clamps off the leg assemblies because the glue is dry. And the next thing I want to do is make a groove across each leg for the draw support. Well, now I want to spend some time sanding the edges of all the parts, either by machine or by hand, to give it that rustic look. Oh, good morning. Before I quit last night, I did finish the sanding of all the leg assemblies and the other parts for the base of our table. And I'm starting today by adding a decorative element. On the original, the mortise and tenon joint was held together with a dowel pin. I'm installing one just for looks. Of course, the glue will hold the joint together. First a hole about an inch deep, not all the way through. A little touch of glue. And we'll drive in a dowel. Now, using my dovetail saw, I'll just trim it off so that it's just proud of the surface, about a 32nd of an inch, and sand off any excess. Well, now I'm ready to install the draw support. A little bit of glue in the slots that I made in the legs, and then it just gets centered between the legs. And I'll attach it with one four-penny finish nail at each location. Well, now I'm ready to attach the leg assemblies to the top. And I have a bit of a problem. With changes in humidity, this top board has started to cup a little bit. And that's not unusual. And it appears that when I attach the cleat, that it will flatten out. But I don't want to depend on just the screw. So I'm going to put a dab of glue right in the center of the top. I can't put glue along the entire cleat because that would restrict future movement of the top piece. Yeah, that seemed to get it. Now I'll put two more screws on the outbound edges, but no glue. Well, I can already see that the screw on the near cleat is starting to pull through the wood a little bit, so I think I'm going to add a clamp until that glue dries. That's going to do it. And now the center stretcher, and I'll secure that in place with some glue and a couple more four-penny finish nails. Well, now we're ready to build the draw. Now, if you remember, the legs are splayed outward from the top. So I want to make the draw front conform to that angle. So I'll have to bevel each edge so that the top is a little narrower than the bottom. So I've adjusted my miter gauge to one and a half degrees, and I'll trim each end of the draw front.
And that's the back, cut at the same bevel. If you look at the drawer again, you'll note that the quarter inch plywood bottom sits in a groove that's milled in the sides about three eighths of an inch up from the bottom edge. Now to make the dovetails that join the draw parts, I'm using my dovetailing jig. This is a device that allows me to clamp the sides of the draw in place to cut the dovetails, and later I'll clamp the draw front in place to cut the pins. I've adjusted the fingers for the dovetail layout that I want, and I'm going to use my router, which is equipped with a dovetailing bit and a collar. Now, I'll take the side piece, flip it around, and cut the tails on the other end. Now, with the draw front mounted in the top of the jig and pushed up against the stop block, I'm going to turn the fingers of the jig over and set it to the thickness of the board, which in this case is 9 sixteenths of an inch. And then I'll mill the pins. Now one of the benefits of this dovetail joint is that I have a lot of glue surface areas. And the angle of the tail pieces actually prevent the draw from pulling apart. Just a very strong joint. Now for the plywood bottom, I just slide it into the grooves. No glue because I want the sides of the draw to move freely. And finally, the back of the draw, which is glued in place at the dovetail joint. And finally, a way to open and close the draw. I formed a couple wooden handles at my sanding center. I'm just going to put a little dab of glue on the plywood. And I'll tack it in place with the brad into the draw front. And then I'll flip it over and put a couple more brads through the plywood. Okay, let's give this a try. Yeah, that's good. Now, let's see. What about the finish? Well, before I put any finish on our Paymaster's table, I took a piece of scrap pine that we were using and ran a few samples. This is uh, just a wax with some stain in it. This is natural wax. This section right here is just oil finish on the pine. And here I applied some wax over the oil finish. And I think I'm going to start by just putting on the oil. And what I do is flood all the pieces of wood with a nice coat of the oil. Let it set for about 30 minutes, put on another coat of oil, and after that sets for about 20 minutes, I'll wipe off any excess and see what it looks like. Well, here it is, our paymaster's table ready for the first payroll. But you know, I think I'm going to use this as an end table next to my favorite sofa.